This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be financial or investment advice. Seek a licensed professional for investment advice about crypto or any other investment. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Blazing Crypto Podcast. We are Justin and Brandon, and today we're excited to have an episode where we answer your questions. Uh, Questions we've gotten over text, questions over Discord, questions that we get from friends and family and uh, colleagues in in the public sphere. Uh, But first, I wanted to mention uh, that today, Friday, February 4th, uh, we are expecting a jobs update from January from the White House, from the government. Uh, Based on what I've read, it's expected to be underwhelming. Uh, and the markets are going to react, uh, you know, it, this actually may be good for Bitcoin uh, and, and, and that could be explained later. The point is trying to play this global markets game right now is is, is a disaster. Uh, wanting, you know, trying to figure out what the Fed's going to do, what the government's going to do, what China's going to do, what Russia's going to do. The point is um, that's going to have effect on the crypto space and that's really not the game we're interested uh, in playing. On the other hand, uh, to sort of contrast with that, uh, on Tuesday, uh, all of this news was actually announced in a very tight time window in the morning. Uh, first of all, India had announced that they are planning to launch a digital rupee built on Bitcoin, and they plan to regulate that asset class. Obviously, India, one of the largest com- countries in the world. Solana announced they had launched Solana Pay, which apparently they had been building out in the open for months and people just didn't see it. Uh, And basically it allows uh, merchants, consumers to send and collect um, USDC, Solana tokens in a decentralized way, really a first of its kind for what it did. And then finally, like a broken record, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy bought a lot more Bitcoin. And whether they're buying in behalf of other people doesn't matter. Uh, they bought a ton more uh, Bitcoin. I believe the exact number was 660 Bitcoin for a measly amount of 25 million in cash um, in the month of January. So, what I, what we try, try the point I'm trying to make out the gate here is you can follow one set of news and go absolutely crazy, have no ability to control any of it, um, and feel like you've got to understand it and react to it, and it's purposeless. It's meaningless. The other side is you can watch all of the adoption, all of the building, all of the growth that's happening in the space. And again, realize that these realities are, are unavoidable, that uh, the, the demand for this space is continuing to not, not climb, <laughs> uh, explode. Uh, so Justin, as you, as you see news like that, I don't know, what's, a, what's a kind of a big thought that comes to, comes to your mind? I think one of the things that was running through my mind towards the end there uh, when you were talking was... You can't like if if you're if you're letting the news and media drive your macro decision making. Um, I think that's where you're just that you're not going to make it, you know. Because <laughs> um, in one sense, I was thinking, hey, maybe I should wait on my DCA for today to hopefully see the market like tank and then use my DCA. Uh, so that's where I was going and. And that's fine to like make a decision like that based on the news, but I'm not going to be like, oh, maybe I should sell all of my Bitcoin and move into like Beanie Babies or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And even on our platform, the reason we use the word growing wealth is because we're in this space for the the long term. Uh, we're in this space for where this thing will be in five, eight, and 10 years, which yes, in crypto world, eight Eight years is long is long term. So, uh, but yeah, that's a it's a great reminder, e- even for both of us. Um, it's a great reminder that we're continuing to DCA not because of what price we'll do next week or next month, but because we are uh, we want access, we want exposure to uh, the space. So let's dive in. We're going to cram in as many questions as we can and give uh, as responsible answers as we can. I- I'll say at the outset that. Um, some of these questions are not necessarily questions that that I wrestle with or struggle with or that you as a listener may wrestle with or struggle with, but these are likely questions as you get into discussions with people that you know, 
people were asking you questions. And so part of this is a way to just establish some ground rules here, uh, get some, some get, get grounded is what I should have said, uh, and get some good information. And maybe you want to even follow up on this with research of uh, your own. So we're going to start with an easy one. Uh, after, after, you know, shilling the long-term play of Bitcoin, Justin, isn't, isn't Bitcoin, question number one, isn't Bitcoin bad for the environment? That one is probably, um, it's probably been one of the most, uh, contested or just most popular questions, uh, recently, especially by Bitcoin critics, critics. Um, so there's been a lot of energy and time poured into that. So a few things I would say, is Bitcoin bad for the environment? Uh, it basically, yes. Like at, to a certain degree, my cell phone is bad for the environment, right? Bitcoin is bad for the environment. The reason people are saying that is because it uses, it uses up energy and some of that energy comes from, you know, coal oil stuff like that's just really harmful for the environment so i think that's where that's that's coming from and i would say yeah a lot of things are bad for the, like bad for the environment but there's a lot of there's a lot of bitcoin that's being mined on like clean energy as well so um i think once you get into the meat of that discussion and you start doing research you you realize okay yeah there were miners um I know there for a fact that there was miners, I think in Northern China, um, that were strictly mining like off of coal power, you know, and that caused a lot of, um, just conversations on Twitter and whatever in the cyberspace. <laughs> uh, but there, there's also, you know, uh, like America, for example, the United States has become, I was reading, uh, just yesterday, it's become. Uh, it, it went from 4% of all of the mining to 17% of the mining. And uh, a lot of the uh, U.S. mining is actually from clean energy and renewables. So um, that that's kind of like there's two sides to that coin. You know, the, the other thing I think that's a, a positive here is uh, there's a council called the North American Bitcoin Mining Council, uh, and it's made up of Michael Saylor. I think Elon Musk is actually in that council as well. And then a number of the large Bitcoin miners in the United States. Um, a lot of them are, are in Texas, but they basically come together to form a council um, to take this um, criticism and take it seriously and have like very open reporting to say, hey, we have... Bitcoin companies set up in America that are completely 100% green. So I would say overall, Bitcoin as a whole is moving towards this clean energy initiative. They're taking it seriously. The people that are um, in charge of these larger mining companies realize that, hey, we want to be you know responsible. We want to take care of the environment. Um, and so a lot of people that are leading the industry are taking that seriously and pursuing clean energy, clean energy, clean energy. So one of the things I was even reading recently was like they were estimating, you know, in another 15, 20 years, it was like over 90 percent of all of the Bitcoin that will be mined will be off of clean, renewable energy. Yeah, the two two talking points for me, um, and these obviously are not popular because they don't make people jump up and down. But first of all is like you mentioned at the end there, where is it today and where is it projected to go? Like what trajectory is it on? Um, certainly energy is important and this isn't a question to, to, to dumb that down or demean that. I think the second question though, or the second item that I'm interested in is there are, you know, government uh, officials, politicians, bank executives, they, they think using almost any energy on Bitcoin is a complete waste because they think Bitcoin is unnecessary. It's an unnecessary tack on that we don't need. And part of the reason why we don't need it, using their words, is because it upgrades and replaces or threatens things that they've already established and built. Or it puts something into play that they can't control. Yeah. So, of course, if you see something as wholly unnecessary... 
You, any amount of energy uh, it uses is a waste, and, and that would be an angle of attack. Uh, and you know, obviously, we've mentioned as well in the past. I think we mentioned it last 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 episode. There's even exploration and experimentation right now with using previously untapped sources of energy, like volcanoes. Uh, and however, however you do that, I don't know if they uh, are siphoning out uh, <laughs> gas from a lava chamber. I don't understand that, but I am certainly open to understanding it. And that would be that would not only be a really good use of energy. But it would be energy using energy that right now there is no use for. So actually, it's it's almost renewable and sustainable in in, a, in another class by by itself. Uh, so second question, Justin. Last week on the case for Bitcoin episode, um, we we tried to give a a simple high level definition for what is Bitcoin. So playing off of that, question two today is. What is blockchain? Yeah, that um, that one, I've had to explain that to probably 50 people in the last several years. And each time, maybe I explain it a little differently because I learn based on how they respond. Uh, but <laughs> I don't think out of any of those 50 people, like most of them don't like have this great moment of, aha, I understand it now. Right? It's like, it's kind of a journey. Uh, that you kind of have to have multiple passes on, but uh, I, I think the best the best way to describe it for me is like blockchain. Um, I try to describe it like the internet. It's very similar to the internet in that um, you know the the internet you can't see it or or like touch it or feel it, right? You can interact with applications on the internet, but it's essentially a decentralized. Um, network of computers, a global network of computers that are connected. Uh, and that is the internet, right? And all of the information that we're passing back and forth, you know, every day, this video that we're making here, um, all of that is passed back and forth on the internet and stored on the internet. And a blockchain is very, very similar, right? So a blockchain is essentially a network of computers um, that are uh, logging information similar to how information is logged on the internet. So like for Bitcoin, for example, um, it's a network of computers that is keeping a ledger of transactions, right? So if I send one Bitcoin to Brandon, um, first of all, he'd be very happy. Uh, and second of all, that, please, should, yeah. please. <laughs> that transaction would be recorded on the blockchain, okay? And the blockchain is essentially a series of transactions that is distributed to this network of computers and the network of computers says, yep, we verify that's correct. Okay. And, and like millions of computers around the world verify that. So if someone says, Hey, no, uh, Brandon or Justin didn't send that to Brandon. He sent that to, you know, Timmy over here. Well, we can trust the network to be accurate because all of the, the computers are in consensus. So that's at a high level, like, that is a blockchain and that's that's how it works but as you get into you know the innovation there's that is a really basic concept that introduced a lot of other types of applications where you know blockchain instead of just logging information on you know a ledger that all of these computers are keeping track of you can actually log decisions and 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 pass back and forth much more complex um, decisions and data points, if that makes sense. Yeah, the questions the questions I have had to ask myself about Bitcoin, blockchain, etc., have actually revealed to me how little I understand about how a lot of other things work. Uh, so I think I understand the way the current world works better as a result of having to understand how blockchain makes it better, how Bitcoin is different. And one example, I, uh, you mentioned the, a keyword there of consensus. Um, so essentially, there's this there's this immutable ledger of, of transactions, and you're like, well, that sounds kind of boring, and it is. Uh, but what's unique about it, I think, is the fact that you mentioned decentralized, which is another key word. Our current world, and even frankly, the current internet, uh, if you will, it, it runs off of a. a, a, a a mode of centralized authority. There is a single source of 
truth, there is there is one entity that validates everything that that comes into it, right? So in other words, you and I can trust that X Y Z happened because the central authority basically says it happens or doesn't let it pass through unless it did happen, right? So a single source of authority or single authority, central authority validates that basically the the authority gives consensus, right? It's consensus by one, which isn't really consensus at all. And and like you said with blockchain, it's really that the software and the network, the nodes, the individual points on the network are validating and, and, and coming to a consensus. And it's like, okay, well, that still sounds pretty nerdy and boring, but when you start to realize that our entire life and world is built off of needing centralized authorities in every domain of life, our bank, um, our, uh, and my mind just went blank, but basically in our, in our library and our, all of these systems we have in place are built on the fact that we need centralized authorities. And this is not trying to overthrow all centralized authorities. The point is, as they say, Bitcoin fixes that or Ethereum fixes that. Um, we don't need all of these massive infrastructure builds simply to be a central point of authority. So uh, some keywords there, consensus, um, validating, decentralized. Uh, but the point is, this is a smarter version of how to do a lot of things, or it will be a smarter version of how to do a lot of things that we, that we, that we already do. What about this one, Justin? Uh, you know, for a while there, one of the politicians liked to talk about you know, crypto being used by super shady shadow coders or whatever she said. Shadowy uh, super coders. <laughs> there you go. I can't even get it right. Uh, isn't 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 Bitcoin used by criminals? And would you consider yourself complicit uh, yeah. as part of the network that's in, enabling that activity? Okay, I thought you called me a criminal for a second. There, I was gonna like have to uh, edit this one. Uh, no, complicit, complicit. Complicit. Okay. Now, uh, so so I'll give you some data on that. Um, Forbes put out an article. This was like, uh, I think, in January. Um, and they, they basically did a study on what what percentage of the Bitcoin network is for, you know, illegal activity. Um, and they estimated 0.14% of all of Bitcoin transactions. Um, so, yes, there's criminal activity. In Bitcoin, um, there's there's certainly criminal activity on the U.S. dollar. That's for sure. Cash, um, you know, like there's at the end of the day, like that's kind of how I like to address it. Is yeah, technology. Anytime you have emerging technology like this, the car, you know, like back in the early 1900s, the car is coming out and people are saying, eh, we can't have these cars because the criminals are using them to get away from us. Uh, <laughs> so, or, you know, you could say that about a number of things, but the main thing there is it's minute, right? It's, 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 it's very small, um, similar to even like, uh, well, I don't want to change the subject too much, but I had a friend that, kind of had the similar question where it's like, is Coinbase secure? Like, I don't trust Coinbase. Like, someone might be able to hack my Coinbase wallet and, and I'll lose all of my, my crypto. Having too much in there is really scary. I get that. But, um, you know, even Coinbase, at uh, they had less than 0.005% of their accounts hacked last year. And of those accounts that were hacked, it was like the end user's fault because they didn't have 2FA set up. They were sharing passwords with multiple people, you know, stuff like that. So I think we can identify, yep, that's a problem, uh, but that is a very small problem. And, it, and definitely it's a net gain, you know, for the technology to keep advancing. Yeah, that's helpful. A quick question, and then I want to pivot to a next question that's going to take some time. So uh, we get asked every now and then about Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic. Uh, aren't, aren't, you know, are Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic basically Bitcoin and Ethereum? How does that work? Um, yeah, usually what I tell people is quickly, no, and you don't need to spend any more time thinking about those two things. So <laughs> so, for, so just for yeah. clarity's sake, when you say no, you're saying no to what? Sorry, no, those like Bitcoin Classic 
or sorry, Ethereum Classic and Bitcoin Cash are not Ethereum and Bitcoin. They, they're just imaginary little crappy coins that someone made up and you don't need to worry about them. Uh, and the funny thing is, is like a, a lot of people react to that. They're like, wait, what? Like, <laughs> how are they allowed to do that? Um, and it's like, well, it's kind of the Wild West right now for one thing. And you know, anybody can just go make a, you know, their own coin and call it Bitcoin, you know, uh, Bitcoin fast or something like that. And yeah, it's it's a free world. But the reality is, those are completely separate things from Bitcoin and Ethereum. And you, I, I would not suggest investing in them. That's for sure. And just a quick anecdote. Um you know, actually, Bitcoin Cash was created uh, several years ago because people were afraid that Bitcoin w- – they basically saw the, 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 the primary and, and only real use case for Bitcoin as being really speedy transactions and sort of realized, oh, wow, it takes 12 to 15 mi- minutes to settle. Like the whole use case is broken. So they basically forked off of Bitcoin, uh, tried to make essentially a, almost like a, a replicate version – uh, but f- sort of quote unquote fix it, and yeah, so it, it got some adoption. But like you said, they're not the same thing. They're not related. Right. They're not little brother or or distant cousin. Uh, yeah, we don't have any time. We don't have any time for those. All right, maybe a, a much bigger question um, that is I think I think it's a very important question to consider, and this may take up a good chunk of our time here. Is Justin, what do you say? And not only what do you say, but what do you think? Uh, How do you handle this question for yourself? Is is Bitcoin just a bubble? And maybe maybe to start by answering that before we sort of say yes or no or or yes and no. Maybe maybe start out by saying how do you understand the concept of a bubble in a financial market sense? I think from. Yeah, it's really important to start with the bubble aspect of it, like like defining kind of like what it is, because I think a lot of people, when we hear the word bubble a lot, and, and a lot of people probably mean different things by that. To me, when when I hear, oh, this is a bubble, all that means is whatever asset you're talking about is experiencing like a hyper extended growth that's unsustainable in the short term. So we've seen that a lot, we, you know, with, with, with kind of silly stuff, like, you know, one of the big bubbles that everyone talks about is Beanie Babies. Um, there's been baseball card bubbles or basketball card bubbles. I don't, I don't know much about cards. You're much more informed on that stuff than me. <laughs> and then there's a tech bubble, right? Uh, in 2000, there was a tech bubble. Well, those things are very different, right? Like the tech bubble... I would consider that a bubble because like the prices were just going crazy because so many people were flooding into the space of technology saying, this is the future. This is the future. Like let's pour all this money into it. And they were right, right? They were right in the fact that this is the future. Um, But like the reality is not a lot of companies made it out of that bubble. Um, But there was this underlying uh, technology that was very real uh, e-commerce, you know, came out of that. Like, like that's a very real thing that's integrated in all of our everyday lives. And that's like to, so to one degree, yeah, the, the hype was there for a reason, right? Like it was real. Um, but the prices showed, yeah, we're still, this, this is unsustainable. You can't just keep hundred Xing every, you know, 10 months for the rest of eternity. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't work like that. Right. Well, and some people would even say, uh, we're in a tech 2.0 bubble right now, uh, and maybe we are, maybe we aren't. I think not yeah, anymore I think after the last point, two weeks. <laughs> yeah, right, we, the we, bubble is yeah, behind we, we us. Fixed that. We fixed that. <laughs> one one thing I would say is, and, and this is maybe easy for me because I tend to be a contrarian thinker. I don't accept easy binary, de- you know, answers or decisions on things uh, very very easily. But you know. Is it's like is this is, are we in a bubble or not? Yes or no? Tell me right now. And it's like that. That's really not. It's really not a helpful question. Like like you said, what is a bubble? 
it's more like are are we in are we currently in a season of unsustainable hype mania kind of growth that that is a trajectory we would not be able to continue on if the answer is yes what we would be talking about Justin and I is selling some of our positions like we we would we would want to if if the entire world is flooding into Solana I will be selling some Solana and, and I think if you look at the the Bitcoin chart or any any crypto chart you can kind of see this um, hyperbolic trend line but then you see and, and I'm this is bad radio right because I'm trying to like use my finger to draw a chart on screen which is not really effective but you see these like 2013 2017 these times where price just does this hockey stick up I mean, if you want to call that a bubble, that's fine. And we would advocate when when an asset outperforms, any asset outperforms the market wildly, that those are great times to take profit. But the one thing I would say is don't, don't be the kind of person that says, oh, it's a bubble, and then immediately run to this is a fad this is all hype yeah. there's no value here like that is a that is a costly mistake and, and justin you mentioned the fact that out of the 99 dot um, com bust i know we have some listeners that were affected by that because um, they've told me stories but amazon came out of that social yeah. even the the beginnings of social media came out of that um e-commerce like you said here's something i would say um anytime something sort of wild and crazy happens i i, I want to i'm kind of digging in and leaning in i want understanding i want i want to learn i want to pay attention uh there was a guy on twitter on sunday that posted a thread and he basically said yeah the bubble thing is real all over the place whenever there's a bubble normally it is telling you something about what the nature of the future will look like. And there will be things that make it through the bubble, that make it out of the season of crazy hype mania growth. And the point is, don't don't 100% embrace or 100% dismiss, right? Um, now you can do that with Beanie Babies because who cares? You can do that with you know tulips in Holland, who cares? But for a space like this, that's revolutionizing and innovating on such a dramatic scale, don't be all or nothing. Um, and for heaven's sakes, like learn, learn, learn. Justin, anything else to add on that on that topic? Sorry, I get I get that's one of, one of my like passionate answers yeah. to uh, a question. It's it's funny the I almost like threw in this interruption uh, interruption, but you were on a roll, so I didn't. Uh, <laughs> You were talking about like oh all these all of these things that came out of the tech bubble, social media, Amazon, all of the social media stuff, um, and I was like, and crypto, like crypto is an extension of that whole tech bubble, internet craze. Like it is, you know, that a lot of times when we say Web three, that's what we're referring to. Um, so yeah, it's it's. It's crazy. This whole layer of crypto and automation, blockchain technology is all possible because of that tech bu bubble, which I kind of just kind of thought that was kind of fascinating. So, all right, there's a there's a cluster of questions here, and we'll see how many of them we can tick through. So, Justin, we on our website, in our Discord, on the podcast, uh, there have been three primary coins that we have advocated uh, being sort of worth your time consideration. Uh, we think they're worth your dollar cost averaging, dollar cost average investment, not financial advice, obviously. Um, they're at least worth our DCA time, attention, and money. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana, if you're if you're new to us, um, sometimes we get asked, okay, uh, you know that sounds fine, right? What are what are like the next three coins? How do you answer that question? Um, I mean, I've answered that in, in a lot of different ways because sometimes I'm just not happy with my answer at all. A lot of times I'm not, but 
you know. Sometimes it depends on how Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana are doing compared to the rest of the market. Exactly. Um, but what I have learned in my own experiences, uh, and I know you would, you would second this, like in a sense, I would love to tell that person, stop asking that question. <laughs> like the, the fact that you're asking that question, first of all, it's extremely natural. Everyone asks that question. Um, and, and that goes back to our core four, by the way, of honor the king and queen. Like, don't, lo don't be looking for what's going to replace Bitcoin and Ethereum. Just embrace Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? Like, in, in a lot of times people miss the big thing because they're looking for the next big thing, right? Or they, they thought they missed the boat. So I, there's only, there's only two assets that I, I would say two and a half assets that I would, that I would say this is worth literally investing money into from, from my perspective, I, I want to invest money into them over an extended period of time, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I would include Solana. That's the half. Uh, and let me clarify that statement with the Solana being half. The reason I say that is it's... Are you hedging? Uh, Are you hedging? A little bit, maybe. The So Solana is like a coin that has an entire ecosystem being built on top of it of applications for different types of stuff. Um, and it is very quickly on the track of where Ethereum was, uh, you know, several years ago. So Solana is kind of like the big one that's up and coming. A lot of times when people ask, they don't actually ask, they don't think about Solana with, with Bitcoin and Ethereum. So I actually offer them, hey, Solana is a good option if you're looking for something that isn't Bitcoin and Ethereum to invest in because it's far enough ahead to have this network effect where it's like a snowball that's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and it's probably the only project that isn't Bitcoin and Ethereum that I can say that about, right? Like there's a, there may be a few others where we could kind of put them in that category, but the reality is all you had to do for the last, you know, 10 years, just keep buying Bitcoin and Ethereum, like don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, and there's a reason for that. And honestly, as I have learned the market and I understand the different types of investors in the market, um, from interacting with them online and everything, like the good investors in this space, they get that. They honor the king and queen. And like that, that's how they win in the long run with crypto. Yeah, I, I will, I will definitely cop here to, um, I had some, I had some pretty bad FOMO about a year ago. Uh, and Justin, you and I talked about this probably over a number of, a number of lunches and text messages, but you know, I tend to be, I like making really good decisions. I like making few decisions just because I don't want to open up myself. I don't want to get in my own way. Um, and I like, I like making long, you know, good long-term decisions, but I also, <laughs> I also couldn't deny about a year ago, the fact that there were some really good opportunities in the market. And I felt like, if you will, only, only buying Bitcoin, Ethereum and Solana in my portfolio, I felt like I was going to miss out. I felt like there were going to be some 100x, 200x higher opportunities that Justin, you would have exposure to, some friends of mine would have exposure to. And, you know, it, it's wild because it's like, you know, when when you, you, you have the same information everybody else does and someone gets, uh, you know, puts $1,000 and it, 200 X's. I mean, you're like, Oh man, I was looking right at that. But fast forward a year later, you know, Solana ended up leading the market in two separate, uh, two separate phases where it was outperforming everything by six, seven, eight times in a, in a two week period. It literally led the entire market, um, in, in two separate phases. And yeah, the point is, if all you did in the last 12 months, 14 months, 18 months was dollar cost average into those three coins, you outperformed the market. And so my, the, the point we're making is what you're really saying when you want to chase the higher yields 
you're saying you want to outperform the market and you think that you need to outperform the market to have this make sense. And time and time again, if you, if you, if you, you know, if you let enough time pass by, you find that if you tried to outperform the market, you didn't. If you, the, on the other hand, if you stopped worrying about outperforming the market, you probably did. And that's kind of one of those paradoxical elements. And again, we're trying to bring clarity to that. Sometimes I wish I listened to my own advice, um, but I think that's a good that's a good point that it's worth worth repeating. The one last tag on that I would say, <clears throat> I like I own things that aren't Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Solana, right? I I've got NFTs, I've got some other smaller like um, micro cap coins. So I'm not saying that there's not good opportunity there, but if if you're coming into crypto and that's where you're starting, that's a really, really scary place to start. So my my suggestion would be build a strong base, a core portfolio of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some Solana. And then once you have that established, okay, what other opportunities can I can I look at or are there are out there that'll give me higher upside that are newer technology, emerging technology that's just riskier, but it does have a higher upside. I love having those conversations. But the risky, risky stuff is not where you want to be starting the conversation. Yeah, at a minimum, I mean, number one, it's free to learn. It's free to ask questions. Um, and so identify, you know, do what they, they say, like lurk before you, you lunge or you, you jump or whatever, like identify five or 10 coins, watch them for three months, you know, read about them, invest about them, uh, or, or read and research about them um before you invest but i would say again you know one of the things that we always have in our control is what percentage of our portfolio allocation do we allow a certain coin to to be and and that's one great way to manage risk if you want exposure to some really high upside you know take 0.8% 0.8% or 0.5% of your entire portfolio and invest in that coin. And even if it goes to zero, you've lost 0.5% of your, of your portfolio, but taking a 12%, 18%, 25% position, it's just, you don't need to bear that amount of risk given the natural upside you already have in the space. But don't get, don't get cute. Don't, don't get in your own, in your own way. Justin, last question here for today. You referenced this, and so I'm going to piggyback off of it. We will have an episode focused on NFTs uh, in the month if things go to plan. So give us a like uh, NFT 101. What is an NFT? And uh, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Okay. So I love that. This is like probably my favorite thing to talk about in all of crypto. NFTs are so cool. Um, so the best way actually to understand not it, financial advice yeah this is not financial this advice. is not financial advice of course because uh, it's about you know pictures and nfts and stuff no the so the best way to understand nfts let's start first with understanding like bitcoin a little bit so regular like i'll just say regular with quotation marks cryptocurrencies um you know there's there's 21 million bitcoin right there's like there's just a bunch of bitcoins that are out there. There's 21 million. Uh, Ethereum. There's like there's a bunch of Ethereum coins, but with NFTs, uh, NFT stands for non fungible token. So the thing that makes it unique is there's only one of each NFT, if that makes sense. So there's 21 million bitcoins, but there's only one of my you know Meerkat Country Club uh, NFTs. Now there's 10,000 meerkats, but I have this one and this one cannot be duplicated. So zooming out, what I like to tell people is like, think about, think about the things in your life that are physical documents, right? You might have a safe in your house that has your birth certificate. Uh, it might have your car title, some other important documents, like, I don't know, your passport or something like that. Well, in the future, those things will not be, phys- they're not going to be on physical paper, right? The physical aspect is what we have now that's analog, but in the future, those things are NFTs, right? It's a traceable document that's verifiable on, on the blockchain. Um, it's a digital version 
of your car title. Think of it like that. And so if now that you kind of have that picture in mind, let's say in 10 years, you know, if you want to take out a, a, a home equity line of credit, well, you've, you've got your deed to your house. That's your NFT. You can connect it to a protocol. You're verifying ownership of your home through this NFT. And you can actually use that NFT as collateral to take out a home equity line of credit, whatever, you know, fix the roof, fix, you know, add a deck onto your house, whatever. But essentially NFTs, um, they're right now they're being really, um, they're used a lot for art. Uh, so that's kind of like this whole NFT space that's currently blowing up. Um, the first use cases for NFTs has really exploded in uh, specifically digital art. And then uh, music is becoming very popular as well. You know, so it's the really cool, I think, transformational thing about NFTs is it's taking these things that um, historically, you know, artists have struggled. If you want to be an artist, you've got to get up and running. That's a really, that's a really challenging feat. Well, NFTs opens up a whole new market for digital artists to build some really cool digital art and sell it online. And it's verifiable, like I can go buy digital art, have it in my wallet, I can even display it in my house, you know, on a, on a, on a digital um, uh, picture frame. So there's kind of like this whole new industry that's up and coming where um, pop culture is getting uh, a lot of attention into it and, and the art aspect is taking off right now. But I think the future, that's where you're going to start seeing those things, like I said, your birth certificates, your car titles, any legal document, uh, marriage license, all of that stuff will be NFTs. Yeah, two key words, and we'll we'll say more about this in our NFT, you know, one hundred and one or NFT introduction episode, whatever we call it. Two key words to think about as you think about NFTs. Uh, number one is status, and number two is access. And before you, you know, before you sort of, you know, roll your eyes at thinking about status, you know, we all understand that to some degree, the car we drive, the house we own, the clothes we wear, the brand we wear, the kind of coffee we buy, you know, the, the places we go on vacation, to some degree, there is a status element to those. Uh, it, it's just the way life works. Uh, and, and we almost don't have the ability to sort of live outside of that. And NFTs are no exception. So, you know, uh, you've got, you know, Bieber and Fallon and uh, Paris Hilton, you know, buying Bored Apes, which is an Ethereum NFT. It's a status play. They see other people at their level buying this thing, changing their profile picture on Twitter, and they want, they want in. But also access. And to me, this is actually what makes me perk up and what I'm more interested in. There are going to be concerts in the future. There are going to be giveaways, um, you know, collab merchandise that is only accessible to people that have an NFT in a certain community collection. There are going to be um, things like Jordan shoe, uh, Jordan brand shoe drops for the next Yeezy Six or you know whatever, and it's going to be an NFT sale. And you buy if you buy the NFT. Basically, you can redeem or burn the NFT to get the shoes, or you can actually sell the NFT on the secondary market, and maybe the NFT triples in price in 12 hours, and you know, you, you're know you willing to sort of give your ticket away. Everything is going to be digitized, though. Everything is moving, as someone I heard someone say yesterday, everything is moving from atoms to bits, from analog to digital, and NFTs is really more just like a, a, a very easy demonstration of of that. So again, don't dismiss it, you know, don't dismiss it as how is that picture of a llama worth $150 or you know, two <laughs> Solana? Yes, there's absurdity everywhere. Uh, but again, look for the bigger picture, ask good questions, uh, keep asking us questions. Uh, hopefully this was helpful for you uh, today. Uh, be curious, stay curious. Uh, don't be don't be cynical. So as a parting shot today, I've got to say I'm wearing my, my Duke hoodie. It's Friday. Tomorrow, uh, Duke and North Carolina renew um, what is, and I'm going to mute Justin's mic, the greatest rivalry in sports. So, 
Uh, and that is Ohio State, Michigan, and that will never uh, change. You guys have already played, so you don't have a voice in this. No, I so anyway, Duke Carolina renew uh, the rivalry tomorrow night. Coach K's last game in Cameron Ind- – or not Cameron Indoor, in the Dean Smith Center. So uh, I'm excited for that. Uh, go Duke. And with that, uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we're excited to bring uh, more content in the future. Let us know how we can how we can better assist you, help you, uh, support you. And again, if you want greater access into what we're doing, content we're providing, uh, guidance there, check out blazingcrypto.io slash join. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see you next time. For more information, check out our website at blazingcrypto.io. Additionally, if you have friends that are new to crypto, share our trailhead videos from our website, which is a great way to get introduced to crypto.